viewers and subscribers, welcome again to the Coach's Desk with your host, Coach Minzy. And we have in studio today with us, Simon Preston. But before we get into our talk with um, Simon, I just want to say season's greetings to all my viewers and subscribers out there. You have been dear to us. You are the ones who ensure that this channel um, grow the way that it grew throughout um, this year. Thanks so much. And uh, I just wish you all the best for the ensuing year. And we hope that you'll bring more viewers and subscribers to this channel. Now, Simon Preston, happy holidays and welcome to the Coach's Desk. Thanks very much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. And all the best to you and your team for, for the new year. Thanks very much. I appreciate that as well. Now, Simon, um, give us a, in a shortened version, who is Simon Preston? All right. So, well, in a nutshell, Simon Preston is a sports reporter, presenter at the RGR Galena Communications Group. I've been basically in broadcasting for about 10 years now. You know, the journey you could say started in around 2010, where there was a football-based quiz show called Set Play and the winner of that competition got the opportunity to be an analyst for the 2010 FIFA World Cup and okay. you know, with, with a lot of hard work and preparation I turned out to be the winner of that competition. From there I got the opportunity to be an analyst locally during the World Cup and from there you know it's the rest is history from there on in but that was where you could say the starting point was for me in my journey in broadcasting and, and sports as a whole really so I've been grateful for the, the opportunities thus far. And I think, you know, it's one day at a time from here on in. All right, cool. Well said. Now, which sports did you play in high school and which high school was that? <laughs> so I attended Hillel Academy High School located in Northeast St. Andrew. I played football. I also did swimming. Those were the two sports that I played for my, my high school. In, in prep school, I also did a bit of basketball as well, but mainly football and, and swimming were the main sports that I did. I was a, I started out as a, a holding midfielder, central midfielder, and we got a new coach in former national player, Fabian Davies, and he thought that my height would be a good advantage at centre half. So I spent the majority of my high school, you know, time as a central defender and you know to this day you know normal kick around with friends and stuff central defense is you could say my most natural position so yeah football for me has always been my love since i could start remembering things all right good now um what brought you into journalism because after attending illel academy you said right um then persons would probably think you'd go into the medical field into the field of law and so forth but what brought you into sports journalism well you know from from that perspective growing up like i said i've always had a passion and a desire for sports but i never thought until i was around 15 or 16 that the, this would actually be my career path I would always follow footballing statistics, data would carry a book around me with information. So that's how I could say the knowledge base started to grow. But I would say what you know laid the platform to acquire the, the skills and ability for the industry would be attending the University of the West Indies. I went to Caramac, the Caribbean Institute of Media and Communications, and it helped me understand the, the theory and practical aspects of, of broadcasting, television, radio, print. And I think with those elements, it helped me to apply the necessary skills and abilities to the industry that I am in today. And, you know, I've embraced everything really. I, I enjoy commentating a lot. I enjoy analysis and I also enjoy presentation. Those are the three aspects that I enjoy the most in this industry as a whole. Cool. And, you know, of course, in any field that um, you are involved in, it's always good to have the accolades coming in. And you won the Prime Minister Youth Award some years ago. Um, what was that feeling like? I must tell you, to this day, it's it's an it's an honor. It's a to be the recipient of such an an award. I've always been grateful to be that recipient to receive it at 19, a teenage at the time, and to be one of the youngest ever in my category in journalism to receive it. I'm still humbled and honored to to this very day. Uh, at the same time, I'm grateful for the opportunities I received during my teenage years to be even in the front running for such an award. My 
opportunities, not only in broadcasting, but also with the Jamaica Football Federation as well to scout players for the national team. So for me, it's just been an amazing journey. And to with the recipient, it's certainly one of the most memorable so far um, in my journey. Did you say you're one of the scouts for the national team? Well, during the, the 2014 cycle, especially under the Captain Borrell-led era, I played a, a pivotal role in bringing in the the UK-based players. So what what was in, in, what I did essentially was to look at players in the Premier League and also the Championship that have Jamaican heritage that could fit in with what Coach Theodore Otapa Whitmore was trying to achieve. So specifically, the likes of Naira Nosworthy, Adrian Mariapa, Joby McEnough, Gareth McCleary, Jermaine Beckford, those in particular, and Daniel Gordon, those were the six players that I recommended and provided data and statistics towards the JFF. And from there, they reached out to the players' agents and got the passports for those players. Awesome. And you are doing a very, very good job um, there, Simon, because you seem so passionate about the national team. Sometimes I wonder if it's a case where you wanted to play for the team and you didn't get a chance to... Um, or, or is it that you believe so much in the reggae boys, or, or, or you wanted to 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 coach, going to coaching, and that didn't work out? So, so you you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, to be honest with you, coaching to to me, it's not a, an area that I've thought about too much. And I enjoy the analysis of the game. I enjoy analyzing the strengths and weaknesses of the opposition. And for me. My philosophy is the best team should take the field and we have this wonderful privilege in international football where we can call upon players in, in the diaspora, players who are born to Jamaican parents or grandparents. And I just feel, for me, even if it's six English-born players on the field, if you have the ability and you have the, the, the commitment, then I have no issue with you being on the field whatsoever because what is the end goal at the end of the day? The end goal is to get to the World Cup. That is what we're trying to achieve. I understand it can be a bit controversial because you want to have individuals from your local system. You want to see it to flourish. And I agree with that at some point you do. But in order to lay the foundation, sometimes you need to, in order to expedite the process, you need to ensure that you have the best team on the field. And I think qualifying for the World Cup, getting that 9 million US dollars from FIFA, you can then lay the platform locally and being able to set up a proper professional league, proper facilities, and also treat the players as professionals as well, where you pay them a proper salary as well. So for me, getting to the World Cup, hopefully we can be able to lay that foundation first so that we can continue to and start a process of integrating more domestic or local-based players in the squad. The aim right now has to be to get to the World Cup and to remove that, that debt that we have right now surging over a million US dollars. So for me, the passion is is finding players from all across the globe that qualify for Jamaica, whether you're born in Germany, the Netherlands, England, all over. And, you know, I have a database where I track all the, the names of players. Certainly. And you are doing such an awesome job there. Um, again, Simon, I can't overemphasize that. Um, are you still in that post with this administration in terms of um, getting players, um, watching players, analyzing and support and make recommendations? I am not in, in the post. However, I have been asked, well, you could say I've been told by the hierarchy that if I have data, if I have statistics, then feel free to share with them or the coaching staff. And I have done so. So although I'm not in that capacity, I, um, I still have the leeway to email or share information of, of those individuals. I don't think there is anyone in that capacity right now with the, the effects of the virus, there's been a lot of changes at the Jamaica Football Federation. So there's not a lot of you know positions that are filled, even though there are many that have to be. But at the same time, I still do my best to say, you know, there are players that are right now impressing and are on form. Right now, Ivan Tony is doing a wonderful job at Brentford, amongst many other players. And we're just a way to see players such as him that can start a process for a Jamaican passport. So by the time the Gold Cup and even the qualifiers come around in September, then we will have all the players available in our pool. Definitely. And also, I've been taking a look on the Roof um, player there. He has been doing excellent over there in, in Scotland for Rangers. I mean, he has scored like three goals in two games um, mm -hmm. so far. So he has been doing well um, too. So the hope that um, 
these players that are um you are putting out there definitely will grab the attention of the management staff that they will ensure that these players get on board because the ultimate goal definitely is qualifying for the world cup now this passion that you have simon it has brought you to um conceptualize the reggae boys commentary pod podcast mm -hmm. you know um mm -hmm. and i do believe that you basically you're more about the reggae boys than the the administration I, i'm not I'm, I'm not sure you can correct me if i'm wrong because i've never seen the administration do highlighting players and so forth how did yeah. this idea um, come about well, from around 2007, I've been uh, a member of the Reggae Boys Forum, which is like an online chat room where you discuss about players and different aspects just to keep abreast of Jamaican. And I just gave a thought to myself in around 2011, 2012, that we don't have any platform, whether locally or even in the diaspora, where Reggae Boys fans or Jamaicans as a whole could track our players to see how they're doing club-wise. Have yeah. they picked up any injuries? Are they winning any awards, goal of the week, player of the week? And I just felt that, you know, with my ability of being able to track these players, that I could use a platform to highlight the players. So at least we know how they're doing club-wise. So by the time it is an international break, we know why they have been called up for the squad or perhaps why they've not been called up to the right, squad right. as well. So, so for me, it's just a, a, the YouTube channel is something that I enjoy and, and you know, I look forward to posting about players each, each and every week. That is where, yes, you're right, that's where my, my focus lies because that's where I want it to be because at the end of the day, the administration can either do good or bad, but how are we going to qualify for the World Cup? Well, it's what we do on the pitch at the end of the day. You know, Definitely. that's going to be the big, the big difference definitely and also um just well, well before i get into that question let me move um these out of the way now given yeah. the schedule that the um that has been set up for 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 the ensuing year where gold cup and the qualifiers are concerned um there has been a level of poor leadership in the administration according to coaches desk do you see that affecting the, the, the reggae boys in making it to Qatar? I think <clears throat> that's one area in particular. My biggest issue is that you uh, have a radar, you are, you're on a player's radar, you have a player on your radar, and they're not called up for years later. I think you strike the iron when it's hot. Mm -hmm. and, spe and specifically, Daniel Johnson, when he was at during his days at Aston Villa in 2010, yes. that that would, would be the ideal time. But you see, when we get to give him his debut ten years later, Ravel Morrison, Captain Horace Burrell, said in a press conference in 2013 that he's working with Roy Simpson to get this player in the setup. We had to wait seven years to see this guy in national <laughs> colours. Seven years, and and the biggest issue for me, where Tapo was concerned, he took the job in the second stint in 2016, September 2016. We already missed out on qualifying for 2018 World Cup. So what were you building towards? The 2022 World Cup. And you wait four and a half years oh. to blood new players in the squad. And you had two Gold Cups, you had a Caribbean Cup, and now you're trying to squinge in new blood into the squad when you had all these opportunities prior. For me, that is just, I'm just still livid about that because you right. had four, four years to give these opportunities. I understand you want to give local players an opportunity, but there are still sufficient FIFA dates be able to introduce the players that you want in instead of at this late stage where we're going to go into a World Cup with a handful of new faces and we might go into World Cup qualifying with still a lack of cohesion. That's that that's certainly correct there. And um, as you mentioned, the local players, it worked in time past, in recent past, when, when Rene Simons was there and they still had to draw for a few um, overseas based players. No, with, with, with how football has, has, has transcended from the, the local borders, so to speak, it, it's very difficult for us to rely on a league that is below par to get players to qualify for, us, um, for, for, for a world tournament. So I agree with you that the, the local base players aren't enough to assist us in qualifying for the World Cup. 
And of course, the debacle, the debacle that is happening with our league right now is, is, is just mind boggling. So are we going to wait on these players? Are we going to wait on a league when we have a tournament in July and the qualifiers? No, we have to go and get these players. So definitely, I agree with you there, Simon. No, I believe that the reggae boys need a central defender and a defensive uh, midfield. What do you say about that? For me, my biggest area of concern is holding midfield because we're first the first time we're going to go into a World Cup qualifying cycle without the likes of a Rudy Austin, a Marvin Elliott, and even like a Javon Watson. And the midfield for me is just such a critical area, especially the ones that protect the back four. Right. We, saw, we saw glimpses of what Joshon Anglin can do over in Saudi Arabia. Can you do it in three games in the space of nine days? I am not sure of it. So definitely we're going to need the depth mm -hmm. of that element. So for me, the whole in midfield options are definitely important. Yes, Daniel Johnson can play that role, and we saw him do that against Saudi Arabia. He's more attacking. Believe, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think you could play a player in their best position. Right. In, case of, in case of injuries and you have no other options, fine. Let him do a job. No problem. But in a case like this, Daniel Johnson, as an 8 or a 10, a bit more effective. So where the whole midfield options, I would like to see Isaac Hayden from Newcastle and where central defences have tweeted in the past about Liam Moore who has expedited the process for his Jamaican passport. So oh, that's hopefully good. early in the new year. Yeah, hopefully early in the new year and England starts to open up a bit more and the Jamaican High Commission opens in the new year. Hopefully by January or February, we can get that passport sorted for him. But this player, um, I've been tracking, Mason... Holgate is a very useful. I believe that if we get Mason Holgate, he would have been the man, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. what, what, what are you, are you having any information about this, this lad? Because from what I'm understanding is that he's waiting patiently for his opportunity to play for England. Yes, that, that is true. There was an interview where he did recently where the question was posed to him about Jamaica. Mm -hmm. and, what he, and what he says for is that he's not ruling out the move, but his priority at that time was to break into the starting 11 for Everton, to not right, be a squad right. player, but to be a regular. I can understand that. You know, your club football is your bread and butter. I am not ruling him out, but at the same time, I don't want this time next year to come and there's still a bit of indecision. I want committed players in the setup and mm -hmm. players that are not just going to come here to take a few selfies, put themselves in the reggae boys jersey, get a thousand likes and just be a prima donna in the setup. Right. I'm not saying I'm not saying that Mason is going to do that, mm -hmm. but I just think that right now I don't see it happening before the Gold Cup because he is on this mission with Ancelotti to get Everton into the, the Euro European places, the Europa League right. next season. So he, he is a player I would like in the setup, though. Absolutely. To answer your question, I want to see Mason Holgate involved in the setup. Do I see it happening? Not before the qualifiers, to be honest with you. I don't or, see it happening. Or probably another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Right here. All right. There's this, also, this, this, this one player also who did exceptionally well at the youth level, especially in our local schoolboy football league in Tyreek McGee. I, 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 I see glimpses of quality from that youngster, but in terms of his development, I, I don't see him as one that we need. So um, in, in, in other words, I don't see him as the quality. If, if we get, if we have a a Ryan Johnson, if we have a, a Ravel Morrison, then if 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 one of those players are out and to put Terry Maggie in, I, I think that will be lacking quality. What say you? I understand the, the doubts that you have in Tyreek Maggie because he's not getting any games in the first That's team. Again, yes. Although he's bossing the under-23 league, you know, it's big man ball game we want to see everybody play, not yeah. under-23 level where you're coasting. So, my hope for Tyreek is that whether January or the summer, he's able to get a loan deal where he can get some playing opportunities. But regarding your question about the national setup, 
I don't, right now, right now as I speak, I don't see more than a squad player. I don't mind having him in a 23-man squad, gelling in with the new players, communicating with Maria Hector to just gauge, you know, what it's like to play in England and just learn from that sort of experience. But to, to put him on the field and say, that's my man for the Gold Cup, that's my man for the qualifiers. No, not yet. But as a squad player, I don't mind having him in a 23-man squad at all. He'll be useful. He'll be learning the whole um, professionalism from the other players and so forth. So, yes, it will be useful. One other question I want to ask you, um, Simon, about um, Andre Blake. I did a video on Andre Blake. And one of the reasons I did the video, because he has been winning a lot of accolades over there in MLS. Player of the Year, Goalkeeper of the Year, Golden Glove. and somehow he has not broken into a European team. Do you have any information what has caused that? Is, is his agent lazy? Is his agent not doing what he's supposed to do? Should he fire his agent? <laughs> the MLS is, is a funny league, you know, boss, because you know like how you might play for Harborview and Manchester United might want you. Manchester United would talk to Harborview. But in MLS, they don't talk to Philadelphia Union. They'll talk to the league. They'll talk to MLS as a whole. So it's quite funny in that aspect. And it's not due to a lack of interest because specifically Crystal Palace has shown an interest in, in Blake. But the money that the MLS wants for Blake is more than what Crystal Palace is willing to pay. Oh, and that is the frustrating thing about it, yeah because Andre Blake is a generation Adidas player, franchise player for his club. So the, the MLS wants in excess of 10 million US for this player. And Crystal Palace is not willing to go above 8 million for, for this player. So it's, it's again a scenario where one team wants this and another team wants that. And there's a breakdown of communication. What I've seen happen, though, is that Andre Blake signed a new contract with the union. I think this could boost up his, his transfer value. Mm -hmm. And this might entice other clubs. And it, I think it might, will come to a point where the MLS will have to let him go. And I think he just turned 30 last month. Yes. So I think whether it's, it's next year or the year after, I feel at some point he will be playing in Europe. So for him, and especially for us as Jamaican fans, it's going to call for a little bit more patience. But yeah. his ability right now, he could go anywhere in Europe he wants. Yeah, I think he's one of, the, uh, one of our best goalkeepers today. Yeah. Um, who has done the national colors? Yeah, Simon, it was interesting talking to you um, about the reggae boys. There is a lot more that we could delve into, but um, I'm just gonna have to cut it there. And I'm sure that you'll be open to be here on the coach's desk another time. Is that absolutely? So <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I, yes, I want to get you on record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man not a problem what no matter the topic gold cup qualifiers squads anything no problem definitely yeah. definitely we really appreciate that we really appreciating you taking uh time off of time out of your holiday season to be here with us on coaches desk we really appreciate it thank you again for um allowing some of your viewers now to come over to view the coaches desk, you know what I mean? Yeah. So before we go though, Simon, any final words that you want to um, share with us, our viewers and subscribers? Well, what I would want to say to all viewers or subscribers, we know that we had quite a, a difficult year, a challenging year, but just like all obstacles in life, once you're focused, you're driven, you can achieve anything you want in this world. Don't let anything stop you from achieving what you want to achieve. If you want to open that business, you still can do it. If you want to travel the world, you still can do it. Just keep the next necessary protocols and, and precautions in place and you'll go places in life. All right. Well said. Well said. And again, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the rest of the season. Be safe and continue to do what you're doing. All right. Same to you. Thank you.